It is uh, one of the great joys together each and every Sunday on what we call the Lord's Day to worship together. Amen? And to now come to a time where we sit under the Word of God and ask for God to teach us. And today we're in uh, week two of the series we're doing this fall in the parables. So if you want to pull out the booklet that you got maybe last week or got today, if you didn't get one, try to get one on your way out today, or just want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, we're going to be looking at what is a very short parable. In fact, though we'll look at the whole story, it's just one verse. And as you're turning there, I I do just want to emphasize tonight, I'm looking forward to our worship night. It's not a concert. It's not a time for you to come and sit while other people sing to you. It's a time for you to come and sing, and I hope you'll be there tonight. Also, this Wednesday night, because it's our 40th anniversary this week, uh, we're having a birthday party here Wednesday night. I hope you'll come. We're going to kick it off about 5 out in the parking lot. We're going to have jump houses for the kids, uh, some food, a bunch of birthday cakes. We are going to have a little presentation, but really the whole night is designed around just hanging out. So uh, we're going to have tables and chairs, but if you want to bring lawn chairs to hang out, uh, please come and be a part of that Wednesday night. Be praying for good weather. And then next Sunday, uh, we're going to have a time in our service where we recognize our 40th anniversary. It'll be a very special day. So a lot of wonderful, meaningful things happening this week, and I do hope and pray that you will all be a part. To get into this text today, I want to take you back in history, American history, to the 1858 election in the state of Illinois, something I know you've all been just tagging, you know, having angst over. But it was a a time in which Abraham Lincoln was running for U.S. Senate. He is not the president yet. We all know Abe Lincoln. And this is a time, a pivotal time in life for a country where the horrors of slavery were extending into the Western territories, and and Lincoln gave a speech called a House Divided Speech. And that speech became famous, and he gave it all over the country, and he said in the speech, he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. Of course, the Civil War would come two years later, and 600,000 people in this country would lose their lives over this battle. Yes, it is true that a house that is divided cannot stand. That's true not just of a country, it's true of a business. If someone in a business says, we should go this way, and the other partner says, no, we need to go this way, at some point, if they don't come together, that business will fall. Churches can fall if they're divided. Families can fall If they're divided, this time of year, we got a whole lot of families divided over college football teams on Saturday, a lot of houses that are divided each and every Saturday. And no, 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 no. And in a much more, (laughs) in a much more serious way, marriages, marriages can fall if they are divided. I I read of one story, this, this couple in Cambodia, they were married for 18 years, went through a nasty divorce. And they divided all things in two. And and here's what this uh, husband did with his friends. They came over, and as you can see here, they literally sawed the house in two. He took his half, he gave her her half. Now, this idea of things dividing if they don't stand in unity is not something that Abraham Lincoln came up with or anybody else. It's something that Jesus said. And it's found in this passage today in Matthew chapter 12, as Jesus talks about how a kingdom that is divided will not stand. And yet he does it in the context of exercising a demon. If we read the parallel passages, this is a time when huge crowds were gathering. In fact, Mark says that Jesus couldn't even eat. There's so many people that were gathering around him. And then the most amazing thing happened. But... Don't take my word for it. Let's listen in. If you guys would, let's stand together. Let me read for you Matthew 12, verses 22 through 32. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the man who was unable to speak talked and could see. 
And all the crowds were amazed and were even saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And as Satan is casting out Satan, he has become divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if by Beelzebub I cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out the demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first ties up the strong man and then he will plunder his house? The one who is not with me is against me. And the one who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Father, as we open up your word Each and every Sunday, we ask that you would do what you promised to do with your word, by your spirit, and that is to teach us, to correct us, to rebuke us, and to train us for righteousness. God, we are listening, and we ask that you would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you heard him make that statement, every kingdom that is divided against itself cannot stand. We're going to end the teaching time today with a beautiful representation of unity in Christ by taking communion together today. And that's always a special day when we get to take communion. But we want to reflect on this text for a few moments before we take communion. Jesus here had healed a demon And in so doing, teaches a larger lesson about who he is and what he wants them to do. Now, anytime you read a parable, and again, this story has a very short parable. In fact, it's just one of the verses I read that has the parable in it. But we want to ask a couple questions. And there's questions that came to my mind as I studied this text this week. And I think that at least touching on them might be helpful for all of us. What are the three questions as we look at this text today? The first question is this, what is the point of this parable What is this leading us to, to to know about Jesus, understand about Jesus? Number two, what's the current status of Satan? I mean, he talks a lot in here about Satan and his kingdom, so it would just be good for us to think about who Satan is and what he's doing. And number three, Jesus says something in the end, that there is a sin, apparently, that is unforgivable. I thought all sins could be forgiven in Jesus. So what is that unforgivable sin? Let's start with the first one. What is the point of this parable? In verse 22, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. This man was unable to to speak, and he was unable to see. Jesus takes the demon out of the man and reverses that such that the man can now see and the man can now talk. Now, for a whole lot of reasons that we don't have time to get into, this miracle itself is demonstrating why Jesus is the Messiah. Only the Messiah could perform a demon exorcism in the way that this is happening here, which is why he is given two responses from this miracle. In verse 23, the crowds see what's happening with these miracles of Jesus, and they ask, could this be the son of David? That title, son of David, was a messianic title. Was this the one? Is this the one that we've been waiting for? Jesus seems to be checking all the boxes of what the Messiah was to be and to do. But in verse 24, we have a very different reaction from the Pharisees, the religious leaders at the time. When they saw it, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They are ascribing the work Jesus is doing to Beelzebub, which is a, which is a kind of 
mysterious, cryptic way of talking about Satan. Beelzebub is a title for the prince of the, of the dark rulers. Sometimes it literally is the Lord of the Flies, or the Lord, just to be more clear, the Lord of Dung. That's literally what it means, and where the flies gather, filth. That's a way of saying that it is by the power of Satan that Jesus is doing what he is doing here. Now, they can't deny that he's doing miracles. In John 3, we read of Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who came to Jesus by night and said, Teacher, we, we, no one could do these miracles unless they're doing it from the hand of God, from the power of God. They, they see in front of them what is happening, but they refuse to believe it. And Jesus then gives a rebuttal in verses 25 to 27, saying that what they're saying about him is not only untrue, but it doesn't make sense. Verse 25, he says, knowing their thoughts, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And then he says, whether it's a city, a house, or a kingdom, if it's divided against itself, it will not stand. And here's his point in verse 26. If Satan is casting out Satan, he has become divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Who are they saying is giving Jesus the power to do this miracle, Satan. They're acknowledging that evil, a demon, is coming out of this man. Jesus' point is, if Satan is the author of evil, and I'm taking evil out, how can evil and evil be divided against one another? It will not stand. That's his whole point. Now, Jesus is not saying that Satan's doing it. He's just making the reasonable point. And then he says in verse 27, and if by Beelzebub I cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. We do read in the scriptures, though there are not a lot of references to them, but the Jewish establishment had its own exorcists, people that could apparently pray certain prayers and do certain things to help demons come out of people. We read in Acts chapter 19 about these kinds of exorcists. And when those exorcists cast out a demon, the immediate response was, this has to be by the hand of God. But when Jesus, who seems to be doing all the things that the Messiah was expected to do, when he casts them out, they say, no, no, this is from the power of Satan. He says, even your own exorcists will judge you. They will look at you and say, what you're saying is wrong. He says, but, verse 28, but, and this is the truth, if I cast out the demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's his way of saying all the prophecies of the Messiah are being fulfilled literally in front of your eyes. Where I was born was a fulfillment of prophecy. The, the tribe of, of, of Israel that I'm from was a fulfillment of prophecy. The teachings that I'm giving are a fulfillment of prophecy. All the miracles that I'm doing, making lame people walk, blind people see, deaf people hear, dead people alive. These are all descriptions you know. You are Bible people, he says to the religious establishment. And if you will acknowledge what is so plain in front of your face, then you would see that you are living in a time of history like no one else because I am in your presence. The Messiah is in your presence, which means that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then in verse 29, he makes a statement about what he is here to do, which is beyond just convincing these particular pharisaical leaders. And this is the parable. Again, sometimes parables are very short. This is a very short parable, verse 29. How can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first ties up the strong man and then he will plunder his house? 1 John 3, 8 says this, the son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is saying in this very short parable, if you want to know what's actually happening with Satan, it's not that Satan has given me the power to do miracles. In fact, what's happening is that the strong man, Satan, who for decades and years and centuries has had people bound in prison, I have come to bind up this strong man and to set the prisoners free. 
I have come to bring deliverance in the lives of people, deliverance from their bondage, deliverance from their sin. In this man's case, deliverance from this demon possession in his life. I have come to set them free. I love what one commentator says of Jesus. He says, Jesus is on the front line kicking the devil's door down and setting captives free. A little aggressive, but I like it. I like it. This incarnational attack, as one commentator says. Jesus Christ is binding up the power of Satan and plundering all of his prisoners of war to set them free. The kingdom of God has come upon you. So Jesus, yet again, is drawing a line in the sand And this gets to our first question. What what is the point of this parable? Look at verse 30. The one who is not with me is what? Against me. The one who does not gather with me scatters. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying this. You are either with Jesus or against him. You're either with me, he says, or against me. Just as Satan is not divided against himself, Christ is not divided against himself, and it's impossible for you to be half with Satan, half with Christ. You're either all with Christ or all against Christ. You're either for me or against me. There's no neutrality with Jesus. You can't be Switzerland with Jesus. Sometimes people act as though they're just, you know, they're neutral to Jesus. It's like, hey, look, Christians, I mean, you guys, I get the whole Jesus thing. I mean, he seemed like a great guy. Like, he taught good things, love your neighbor. We need more nice people in this world. I mean, Jesus, great teacher. I'm just not down with the whole son of God. I mean, how can you say he's the only way to heaven? I mean, think about all the religions around the world. These are the kind of comments that people say, and they act like, hey, I'm just, I'm neutral to Jesus. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm cool with them. I'm not against them. I'm just, I'm just neutral towards the thing. You know what Jesus is saying in this parable? He said, if you are not with me, you are actually against me. If he is plundering Satan's house, then you have to make a decision, am I going to go with him or stay locked up in the house? That's the point of the parable. He's calling them to account for the fact that the Messiah is right in front of them. But since he talks so much about Satan, let's think for a minute about that second question. What is the current status of Satan, the devil? This is worth the whole teaching, and maybe sometime in the future we'll do a whole teaching just on who the devil is and what he does and is doing, and, and we'll what will happen to him. But just a quick cursory look at the devil. The devil, of course, as the Bible paints him, was a fallen angel, is a fallen angel. He's not co-equal with God. Sometimes people think that, that, you know, God has all this power and the devil has all this power and they're fighting it out to see who's going to win. That is not the Bible. That is actually called Star Wars. They made lots of movies about it. That is not Orthodox Christian theology. The devil has power, but it's limited power And it's power that he has that he uses to tempt people, to lie to people. We see it right there in the beginning of the Bible. He lies to Adam and Eve. He tempts Adam and Eve. And and his tactic is really the same as it's always been. The devil may be really, really, you know, innovative, but, but in the same way, he's doing the same thing over and over again. And he still does the same thing to you and me that he's done to Adam and Eve and every other human being. You know what his great tactic is, his great temptation is, is this. It is tempting you to believe that the passing pleasures of your sin is more satisfying than your obedience to your heavenly Father. That is always his tactic. Now, the sin might change based on your stage of life, the era in which you live, but his tactic is always the same, to tempt you to think that if you give in to whatever that passing pleasure of sin is, it will be way more satisfying than if you had trusted and obeyed your heavenly Father. Now, the greatness of Jesus is displayed in that he came to destroy the works of the devil. And he does it in progression. We see it early on in Jesus' ministry. Remember when he went out into the desert and he was tempted for 40 days like Israel was 
tested for 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus Christ was tested for 40 days in the wilderness, in the desert. And Satan comes to him and tries to tempt him in the same way that he got Adam and Eve to be so gullible and believe in his lies. But Jesus would not believe in the lies of the devil. And he would stand on the word of God. And Jesus left that desert exhilarated, invigorated with the spirit of God to do ministry in the name of God. And the devil's defeat was already beginning to happen. When Jesus sent out his disciples, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. His power is being diminished with every passing year that Jesus is on the earth. And then the ultimate conquering of the devil happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross and he disarmed the powers of the devil. And through Jesus' work on the cross, he is setting the prisoners free so that you are trapped in sin and bondage. You can be set free because of the grace of God exhibited on the cross. That is the power of the gospel, amen? That's the power of deliverance and freedom that we have in Christ. And some of y'all believe it. But he, he is binding the strong man, tying him up, and plundering his house. That's our Jesus. I remember as a kid, I was about eight years old, and we lived on the street with this fairly sharp left-hand turn, and if I had to ride my bike past it, which I did to get most places on my bike, I knew that 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 was a house of horror because every time I went by that house, this black dog was going to chase me up the street. So I had to kind of muster up the courage, kind of get ready, get limbered up, to pedal as fast as I could to get get away from that dog. I remember every single time trying to get away from that dog, and it's, it's interesting looking back on that occasion that I did a number of times to get past the house. Two things come to mind. Number one, looking back, that dog was a Scottish Terrier. Number two, (laughs) I shouldn't have been scared. You know why? That dog was on a leash. (laughs) Now, if I had gotten within the reach of that leash, I could have been harmed. At least that was my fear but I was never really in harm. Jesus Christ has tied up the devil. He is on a leash. Even the devil, as Martin Luther said, is God's devil. And he will one day be destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire. And the new kingdom will come. And death and sin and pain and temptation to sin will be no more. That's the good news of the gospel. But we have a decision to make, and I think that gets to the third. Actually, let me read this before because I I love this quote, Martin Luther, The Mighty Fortress. Martin Luther wrote this. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we... Tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Martin Luther doesn't tell him what that word is, but I wonder if the word is this. Conquered. Defeated. Tied up. Plundered. You're a liar. And Jesus wins. Which does get to the third and final question. What, what then is this unforgivable sin? Jesus makes that comment, verse 31 and 32. Every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And then he says, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. What a text. And I... Wish I had more time to go in in detail about this. I think Jesus is saying something like this. What, in context, let me ask you, you're great Bible students. In context, to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, what are they doing? What is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that they are doing? It's this. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in context is this, ascribing the works of God to the devil. That's what they're doing with Jesus. They're taking what is obviously a demonstration of the power of God, but instead of giving God credit, they're giving credit to the source of evil, the devil. 
That is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But now that Jesus is resurrected, and now that we live in the age of the Spirit of God, what does it look like for us to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What's it look like for us to commit what he calls an unforgivable sin? To answer that, we need to understand what is the role of the Holy Spirit and how does it play into the role of Jesus? Jesus said this about the Holy Spirit in John 16. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I am leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, and he, when he comes, will convict the world, listen to this, regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing right now, convicting people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He says, regarding sin, because they do not believe in me, and regarding righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, and you will no longer going to see me, and regarding judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. He's there speaking of the devil. The verdict is in. We're just now waiting for the sentencing and the execution of the enemy. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them all at the present time. But when he, listen to this, the spirit of truth comes, what's the Holy Spirit going to do? He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, and that is why I said that he takes from mine and will disclose it to you. That text is so much about the Spirit, how he glorifies the Son, how he leads us into the truth, how he convicts people of sin and righteousness and judgment. If we are saved today, it's because the Spirit of God has worked in our heart and life to bring about a revelation of who Christ is according to his word. And upon that revelation of understanding who Jesus is and what he is doing and what he longs to do and what he has accomplished on the cross and what he will accomplish in his second coming, when we understand all of that by the Spirit of God and we repent of our sin and we put our trust, we put the power of our life in the hands of Jesus and say, hey, God, I can't control my life. You control my life. God, I can't forgive myself. You forgive me. God, I can't change me. You change me. When we transfer the ownership of our life from us to God through the power of his son, that is the work of the spirit. So the opposite is this. If you understand who Christ is, and you have a revelation of who the Son of God is, just like the Pharisees were getting right in front of them as they were watching Jesus do miracles and perform exorcisms and fulfill all the prophecies of the Scripture. If you understand who Christ is and you reject that, then you will die in your sins, and that sin will not be forgiven. The unforgivable sin is rejecting the saving work of the Spirit of God. And that is a horrific verse because there are many people, even those sitting in this room today, who will hear of Jesus, reject him, and that sin will not be forgiven if you do not repent before your death and you will spend eternity in hell separated from God because of your rejection of what the Spirit of God was trying to do in your life. A horrific verse. If you are a Christian, a legitimate born-again Christian, can I just give you a word of comfort, though? A true Christian can never commit the unforgivable sin because you have understood and responded to who Christ is and you are truly saved. And that should be a comfort to you. And we are to dwell and reflect on who Christ is. And that's why we come now to the time of communion where we are to take the bread and the cup. And this is to represent two different dimensions in our life. And I'm gonna ask now that our deacons will get prepared to pass out these elements. And I would ask that no one's leaving, no one's exiting. This is what the service has been building up to, this time of responding by taking of the elements. 
And as they come and distribute, they're going to give you uh, a cup. You just take both cups at the same time, twist it out of there, and then you'll see two cups are put together, one with the juice, one with the bread. And these represent the body and the blood of Jesus. This meal is meant to do several things. It helps us to look up to who God is. It helps us to look in to the condition of our hearts before God. It helps us to look back, to think of what Christ has accomplished. It helps us to look forward to what Jesus will accomplish. And here's the thing we often miss. It helps us to look around and be reminded that we are united in Christ as the body of Christ, which is why I have to say this every single time we take it. If you are not a believer in Jesus, we love that you're here. We want you here. We want you to respond to the gospel. But we would also ask that you not partake in this meal because it's not for you. This is for genuine, legitimate believers in Jesus. And I also love to think about that every time we take the Lord's Supper, this is somebody's first communion. Somebody who's recently come to Christ, they're taking for the first time. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pass out the elements. I'm gonna pray for us, give you two or three minutes just to reflect on the meaning of these two symbols. And then I will lead you through taking each one in just a few minutes. Father, we just give this time to you and just pray that you would use this communion to remind us of the power of Jesus and the righteousness that's found in Christ, but also, God, to remind us of the unity that you want us to have in the gospel. Lord, we love you and thank you for this time. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
during that final Passover meal, Jesus took a loaf of bread, which is larger than what we have, and he broke off pieces and distributed it to the different disciples. And he reminded them that from now on, when they take this Passover meal, it would be to symbolize not the Lamb of God from the Exodus, but Jesus as the Lamb of God and his body that was given for us that we might find healing in him. I wonder what it was like for that formerly demon-possessed man who could now see and walk and talk to take his first communion and to think about ultimately healing that comes in Christ. This, this not only represents that our broken bodies are made whole in Jesus for all eternity, but, God, but it also represents that we are united as the body of Christ, each partaking of the same bread together, to take and eat in remembrance of him. Jesus, thank you for your body that was slain and given for us, that, Lord, our bodies might be made whole for eternity with you. God, would this supper also remind us of the unity that we have in Jesus as the body of Christ. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Same way he took the cup said, this symbolizes my blood, the blood of the new covenant. In this new covenant, the Holy Spirit would come and forgive us, and, and the blood of Jesus would be applied to our lives such that all of our sins, past, present, and future, would be completely forgiven in Jesus, such that Paul would say in Romans 8, 1, now therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are saved and forgiven by the blood of Jesus. So take and drink in remembrance of him. Thank you, Jesus, that in you our sins are made as white as snow. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that what makes us a special people is not our gifting or anything else, God. It is that we are forgiven people by the blood of Jesus. And I pray that this supper represents our unity with you our unity with one another, God, would we be a unified church here at Johnson Ferry? If there are divisions here, if there are disagreements here, if there are just um, rumblings between people here, God, would you, would you be the peacemaker? And we'd be reminded of the incredible unity we have as forgiven people. God, how deep is your love for us? Lord, we can't even fathom how deep you love us and how much you love us. It is, it is more than we can fathom. So, Lord, we want to end this time by just singing to you, God, about how deep that love is for us. God, vast beyond all measure. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for the power of Jesus. Thank you for changed lives. Thank you for this communion. And we'll pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.